Welcome to Wildwood Church this morning. We are singing about our salvation this morning. The choir will be singing about being saved. And the first song that we're singing together, the word is redeemed, redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. Let's stand as we sing together, please. Number 301, if you would like to use your hymn book. you're redeemed this morning, say amen. amen. Boy, God's already met with us this morning. If you miss Sunday school, I'm telling you folks, you missed a blessing. Because God was here, and God speaks to us through his word, and I need that. How about you? But it's great to see you in the worship service today. Uh, before we pray, I want to ask you to remember in special prayer, Sister Shirley Pipkin. And all the things she's been going through with Brother Johnny, Finally got him placed, and now she's had a heart attack. And one figure I heard, she only had about 15% of her heart working. And uh, the family's in the throes of trying to decide if her heart stops. Are they going to try to resuscitate her? Are they going to try to save her? Or are they going to let her go? Uh, Brother Johnny's not capable of making those decisions. They have no children. So we need to pray for that family. Would you agree with me? We need to pray for them. Pray for Miss Shirley. She sends her regards. Uh, amazing. She sends her regards to her church today. Uh, so let's pray for her. Miss Wendy is here in Sunday school. We've already heard praise to the Lord from, from her and her behalf. God is so good. Our pastor is on vacation. You know that. He was scheduled to come back tomorrow, but he felt the urgency to come on back today so they're on the road uh, pray for Miss Lindsay she's doing most of the driving because of his back problems he's laying down on the, the seats and uh, the kids are being cooperative and sitting in the back and in the front and so pray for Pastor Jonathan and uh, Lindsay as they travel back today let's remember the families that have been so greatly affected by the storms that came through here uh, I mean uh, Homes completely destroyed. At least one life was lost. And uh, so we need to pray. Families who lost everything. And so we need, to, we need to be faithful to pray for them, okay? Brother Ricky, would you lead us to the Lord in prayer and remember these requests, please?
Yes, yes, amen. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Boy, it is great to see you in, in the service this morning in God's house. Boy, I, I'm so glad that we have the opportunity to be here. Amen. And uh, I'm glad the Lord's here. Uh, I said last week, I don't want to ever come to church when the Lord's not here. But thank God he is here. Amen. And we can worship him together today. If you're visiting with us, and we do have a number of visitors, uh, we welcome you. And uh, in the pew in front of you, there's what is called a connection card. If you would be so kind as to take that and fill it out. And as you leave today, stop by the welcome desk out in the Narthex and leave the card there. And we have a gift for you, okay? Uh, the church has a gift for you, and uh, we're just glad to have you visiting with us in the service this morning. I think that's all the announcements we need to make, and so let's continue on with our service, with our scripture reading as Brother David comes to read the Word of God this morning. If you will, take your Bibles and turn to 1 John, the book of 1 John. First John chapter 1 verse 1 and following says that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life for the life was manifest as we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifest unto us. Verse 3, That which we have seen and heard declare unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write I unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him, and declare unto you and God that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ's Son cleanses us from all sin if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we say that we have not sinned we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If you would take your hymn book uh, in front of you, we, you need that for our next song. Our salvation is dependent or was dependent upon Jesus. He died once and he died for all. Jesus paid it all. Number 241 in your hymnal, number 241. Let's stand as we sing together, please. I hear the Savior say, No. 
That's enough to shout about right there. Amen. Knowing that Jesus has washed our sins away and washed us white as snow. All right. You can sit down if you'll still give. <laughs> uh, Brother Jonathan's probably going to fuss at me for some of my off-the-cuff remarks when he gets back. But uh, uh, it is time to worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings, okay? How many of you God's been faithful to you this week? How many of you God's been faithful to you your whole life? He's always faithful. So now it's time to worship the Lord. Uh, we'll have sides one and three, sections one and three to start, and then two and four come after them. Uh, the plates are here for you to bring your tithes and offerings. And so let's bow our heads before the Lord now and ask his blessing. Brother Linwood, would you lead us in this prayer, please? special today. How many of you would rather have Jesus than anything the world affords today? That's what Brother Bobby was just playing. Next Sunday is what? Are you saying that because you're glad you're going to get the kids out? <laughs> all right. It is back to school Sunday, okay? So we're going to recognize all of our students uh, from kindergarten through college. We're going to recognize all the teachers uh, whether it's public school, Christian school, home school. And so look forward to that great day next Sunday, back to school Sunday. And, of course, don't forget our Revive Conference that's going on this month. Uh, we have the privilege to have uh, Brother Hemet Patel with us both this morning and tonight. And I promise you, if you'll open your heart, you're going to be blessed as he comes in a few minutes. In fact, Brother Hemet, I will not come back up here. Uh, so when the choir gets through, Bob, Brother, let's see, are you... You're probably not playing while they sing, are you? You just take a minute to go down. So if you want to wait until they go down before you come, that way they can look at you in the face while you preach, okay? All right, here we go. The choir's going to sing now.
It is good to be here this morning with you, dear folks. Thank you, choir, for the wonderful song. There's nothing more important in this world than to know that you know, that you know, that you know, you're saved. And I'm glad God has made salvation a no-so salvation. Aren't you glad? It's not guess so, hope so, <laughs> anything like that, but it's a no-so. You know it or you don't know it. You're saved, you're not saved, right? And Jesus does that for us. Aren't you glad? For his blood cleanseth us from all sin, and because of him we have forgiveness of sin and the hope of eternal life. Uh, so I want to say welcome uh, to all of you who are here this morning. For those who are visiting, thank you so much for taking time to be here uh, at the Wild Church. I'm checking the water. See, if you all remember, somebody said that a few weeks ago in your pulpit. Uh, one of those missionaries, you know how they are. Uh, they don't remember what church they're going to, don't remember the name of the church. And Brother Corlata was here a couple of weeks ago, and he told me that his wife scolded him all the way home. He says, surely you can remember the name of the church that you're going to preach and share the ministry. And he said he called Wildwood Church, Wild Church. So, <laughs> welcome to Wild Church, amen? So, your missionary has changed the name of your church this morning. It is a joy to be here, and I was, <laughs> I was, th I was so thankful when your pastor called and he asked if I would come. And uh, another thing, Brother Nick, uh, from, I call him Crazy Russian, uh, he, he said, uh, he said, man, I was sitting and looking at the slides, and saw your picture up there. And I said, what's my picture doing up there? He goes, I don't know, but it was a, one of those young-looking pictures, you know. <laughs> so, so the picture is young. The, what you got is old, all right? So here, here I am. Uh, I'm so thankful to be here. Pastor mentioned coming Sunday morning and Sunday night. I know you're having Sunday evening revival services, and it would be an honor to come and share the Word of God this evening. But it is a joy to be here this morning to share God's word. If you would, open your Bibles with me to Psalms, Psalms uh, chapter 9, please. This morning in the Sunday school hour, as Brother uh, Phil mentioned already, uh, it was a blessing, you know, just to know... <laughs> Uh, the things that God's Word teaches us for clarity and our own good. <laughs> and sometimes we venture, venture out too far away from the truth from God's Word and find ourselves in a lot of trouble like uh, Miriam and Aaron did as you read in the Scriptures. But one of the things uh, was mentioned in the Sunday School Hour was to pray for our country. And it's interesting, uh, uh, my thoughts God has led me to share this morning is about our country. So most of you are probably wondering... Uh, what is an Indian guy is going to talk about America, right? Uh, this is my country. I am American. I got naturalized a few years back. My family migrated to the United States of America. Oh, back in 72, 73, uh, we came from India. And we uh, legally migrated to this country. I want to make sure I make that clear. Uh, because uh, I believe... If a nation has borders, it should be defended. Anybody who wants to come to this great nation are welcome to come. Just come through our legal system. We believe in the law of the land, and we should implement the law of the land. I think God honors that. That is not being discriminative with anybody or any nation or any people. Uh, so I am grateful uh, to be an American. And I hope you are this morning. Whoever you are, whatever you, you're going through, I hope by the end of time I will get through the sermon, you'll be able to say, I am glad that I live in this nation. Now, I know many of you didn't have a choice uh, uh, to be born in this country. You, by God's providential care, were born in this nation. You ought to be grateful for that. For guys like me, I am eternally grateful that in God's divine providence, he saw fit for my family to migrate to this country. Because I truly believe, I truly believe it with all my heart as I look back at my life. And I think most of us can do that as we look back and watch the providential hand of God. Even when we were not saved, God was working on our behalf. 
bringing us to himself. Now, I came 10,000 miles to get to this country, but I came 10,000 miles to find Jesus. And that's the most important thing I think about this country. What if I didn't come here? What if? And that question haunts me often because if I didn't, would I have ever come in contact with Christians? Would I have ever heard the name of Jesus? Would I have ever would have found out that there is grace far greater than all my sin? Would I ever would have learned the Lamb of God has shed His blood for a wretched sinner like me? That I, by faith, can be saved? That's a scary thought, isn't it? Do not ever take it for granted, my dear friends, that not only being in America is a great thing, but the privilege to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and the freedom we have, my soul, the freedom we have to worship like we do without ever, ever to worry about somebody breathing down our neck and the freedom that we have to gather and, and, and preach and teach the, the word of God. When I think about America... <laughs> I, I don't know how to express my gratitude. I really don't. Matter of fact, I feel guilty. I owe it more. I owe, owe all I have, as we say, when we come to, as a Christian, when we think about Jesus, we say, man, in light of all that he has done, I owe it all to him. How dare could I say, hold it now, this is mine, this is yours. It's all yours, Lord. It is you who gave your all that I could have all, and I owe it to you all. Well, same thing I think about this country. You say, are there not other great nations on planet Earth? <laughs> well, I, I lived in one <laughs> that wasn't. And as you and I know, <laughs> when we think about people flooding into this nation from all parts of the world, you have to ask a question, why? You have to ask a question, why? There must be something that makes people so desperate to go through such dire situations to cross the borders. Now, uh, before I go any further, I want to make sure you understand. A nation that has open borders <laughs> is hurting itself. It just makes no sense because I don't know any other nations that does that. But let, may I say this morning, heaven does not have open borders. Don't forget that. There is a way, <laughs> there is the truth, and there is a life. And that is Jesus Christ. He said, I make a way for any man anywhere who wants to go to God's heaven. I am the way. I'm not a way, I am a, the way. Through me, you have entrance into God's kingdom because I'm paying the debt that you cannot ever pay all your life doing all the good you can do. You'll never be sufficient. Jesus has made a way. And I'm thankful that I pray for these who do come from all over the world to this nation just like I did. I hope they ever came in a legal way. But my prayer for people is simply this. They may come to know Jesus Christ. Maybe that's the reason God has allowed them to enter this land. I don't know. Even they're coming through the whatever means they're coming. I'm just saying simply this. Dear God, they're here. I want them to know Jesus. Because you see, you can come to America, and when you live here, and you lived here, I lived here long enough to know this. This is not heaven. Amen? People still die here. People do suffer here. There is sickness here. There is all kind of political turmoil here. It may not be at an exact uh, uh, level as other nations have, but we have it. But there is a place called heaven that everybody can go. For God loves us so much that he has made a way through his son Jesus Christ. A land where there will be no death, there will be no darkness, there will be no suffering, there will be no sorrow, there will be no tears. A land of perpetual bliss. We don't know anything about that, do we? That's what makes our heart long for that, doesn't it? 
The Lord that has to. Just like Abraham longed and looked for a city. It wasn't earthly, man-made. A city whose maker is God. And that's what we long for, aren't we? But till we're here, till that time, God has given us things to do. And I want to share this little story. I might have done it a long time ago here. And, and if I have, you just laugh along with me, okay? And uh, don't, 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 don't uh, look at me and say, hey, come on, Mr. Patel. We heard that one before. Uh, I don't know how to express my feelings about this country. Then this story, how it illustrates it. Is a, is a foreign student came to America to study in the universities, and he would correspond back and forth to his father, who lived in a third world country, a, power, a very poverty stricken nation. And he would write to his dad and tell him all the great things he sees, all the great things he experienced. He writes about the roads that don't have potholes, and lights that work, and water that runs, and is clean, and so on and so forth. So his father will write him back and son, I don't believe everything you're saying is true. There is no way under heaven there can be a nation exist the way you have described. Because dad, I'm telling you the truth. It's unbelievable. You got to come and see for yourself. So uh, when he was going to graduate, his father came to the United States of America. He flew over here to see what all that his son said was true or not. And when he landed, man, he, he was totally blown away. And his son took him to see the great sights of the great nation. And they all, you know, went to Washington, D.C. And, and the great places of the United States. And finally, they ended up in a grocery store. Now, as I said, if you come from third world country, <laughs> a grocery store can be even more immaculate than a Statue of Liberty. I mean, it's just mind boggling, you know, to consider a grocery store with all the stuff. So his dad walks in the store, his son walks in, they're walking, he's a little bit ahead of him, he's reading the labels on the boxes, trying to comprehend how can this be true. Under one roof, so much stuff. And he read a box, and on that box the label simply said, powder juice. So he said, hey son, come here, come here, come here. What does that mean? He said, oh dad, you take a spoonful, stick it in a glass of cold water, stir, instant juice. And his dad said, oh, there's no way, man. You mean you don't have to go pluck an orange or a lemon and squeeze it and get the seeds out and strain it and get the... He said, no, 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 no. Instant juice. So his son walks away. His dad is walking, comes up on another box. And on, on that box it said, powder milk. So he said, son, what does that mean? He said, oh, exactly what it says. You stick a spoonful, stick it in a glass, add water, stir instant milk. He said, you mean you don't have to go and uh, milk a goat or a camel or a cow or a buffalo, strain out hairs and flies and all that stuff. He said, no, 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 instant milk. <laughs> so his dad's walking, his son walked a little further away, and he's still gazing, he came up on a box. And on that it said, pa a baby powder. <laughs> I, got you. I got your attention, didn't I? <laughs> Baby powder. So this time he doesn't call his son back. He just threw his arms out in the air, looked at the box, and here's what he said. Wow, what a country. <laughs> and here's what I want to say this morning to you. Don't lose your wow. Don't lose your wow. What a country you live in. How blessed we are. Even the most grumbling and discontent person, I want to take you on a free ticket to the other side of the world. And I promise you come and kiss the ground that you walk on. The passage is interesting, the one we are about to read in Psalms, Psalms 9. Would you, would you read verse 1 through 4 with me? And then we'll pick up in verse 9 and then our, our key verse for the message this morning. I've entitled our thoughts simply nations that forget God. It's interesting. I don't forget to breathe but I forget the one who gave breath. 
It's interesting, I don't forget to eat. I wish I would. <laughs> but I forget the one who gives the sunlight and the rains and gives life to that seed that gives me bread. No wonder Jesus said when you pray, give us our daily bread that we may remember the one who gives us that and not forget him. Is it possible? It must be. The scripture says, I want you to listen to the word. And before we go there, David begins to praise God as he writes these psalms. And if you are not a student of psalms, and what I'm simply saying, if you, if you haven't read it regularly, I encourage you to do that. Psalms are a wonderful portion of scriptures that will comfort your heart in times when you're hurting. It will encourage your heart in times when you're discouraged. And when it seems like all is lost, it will help you to know there is a God in heaven. And as long as he's on his throne, nothing is lost, my friend. And David, David, the author of this psalm, and, and he brags on Jesus. Look at verse 1. I will praise thee. And we did that in Sunday school class. Praise and prayer are two sides of the same coin, isn't it? I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I'll be glad and rejoice in thee. Man, thank God. When all else fails, this will never fail, my friend. You can rejoice in the goodness of God all the time. As David writes, he's going through some difficult, dire, dark circumstances. I will sing praises to thy name, O thou most high. When my enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou settest in the throne judging right. Verse 9, the Lord also will be a refuge. Aren't you glad? <laughs> that word is a beautiful word. The Lord is a refuge, a place where you, a secure place, a safe place. The Lord will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. <laughs> you always can tell people when they find themselves in trouble, where do they go to get help? That will tell a lot about them. David said, I run to the Lord. He's my refuge. He's my high tower. He's my shield. He's my strength. He's my rock. Would you pick up in verse 17 with me now? Verse 10. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. That's a good promise to remember in this day and time. When you may think of a nation is headed in a very downward spiral, a destructive <laughs> destination, must, we must remember, we who know his name and trust in him, Lord will not forsake those who seek him. Would you pick up in verse 17 now? The wicked shall be turned into hell. And here we go. And all the nations that forget God. Wow. It is possible to forget. It is possible to willfully, consciously say he don't exist. Verse 18, please. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord. Let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Let the nations be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, O Lord. That the nations may know themselves to be but men. Well, that's pretty powerful. That the nations, that the people may know 
They are finite in light of infinite. That we are vapor here and gone tomorrow. And David says, Lord, let them know. Let them come to their senses that they may recognize we are but finite beings. Though we act like we're infinite. We, like, we, we act like we got the whole world by its tail. We act like we know all the answers. If you listen to the politicians of the day, that's what you'll probably conclude. They got it all together, don't they? Scares me. Here's my prayer for them. That they may know. That they may know themselves to be but just men. They're not God. They don't overrule God. God overrules them. They don't control. God controls. It is he. It is his nations. It is his world. Not mine. Not yours. Not theirs. It is God. It's always been. Always will be. We may not never forget that, please. We live in a generation that has gone far from this truth. They think they're God themselves. Just as when Satan offered that to Eve and said, you shall be as gods. And man has got to the point where they think they're gods. They think they got it all figured out, but they can't deal with the sin issue. They can't deal with why my conscience bothers me when I lie. They can't figure out why my conscience haunts me when I go to bed. They can't figure out that thing called conscience is a God-given gift to man to remind them they are but men. That God has written his laws on your conscience and mine and all of every human being. That when we stray from that, we will know we have sinned against God. Nobody has to tell you or me, my friend. We can pretend hey, 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 it doesn't exist. We can try to drown it out, but it has a floating device. It pops right back up. We can try to talk it away, but it keeps coming back and coming back. You cannot, I cannot, men cannot ignore when God is dealing with us. So may I, may I just, you know, when I had to take my citizenship test, I thought every American should do that. You know, they asked me about some states. I said, I didn't know there were how many states in America? And they ask you to write a paragraph in English. They ask you different presidents' name, who they were. And I'm thinking, man, there's a hundred questions you have to study. And I studied them, buddy. I knew them inside out. When I got there, the guy asked me three questions. And after we got done, I told him, I said, why do you guys give us 100 questions to learn? He said, so that you may know. That you may know this nation and its history. God help us. For those who want to erase history. There's something wrong between their marbles up there. For it has been proven. It has been proven. Civilization, civilization, past civilization. It has been proven. A nation that forgets its history is apt to what? Repeat it. And boy, we are finding ourselves. History is not our enemy, my friends. It's our friend. To guide us into a better and brighter path. Not to lead us into destruction. Not to, you know... Mire in that stuff. Oh, yeah. Is there a perfect history? There is no such thing. Are there perfect people? There are no, th no such things. So we, we, we don't try to cover up anything. We just, history just gives you the facts. That's what makes the Christian faith so important. It's a historical faith. You can trace the history of Christian faith. You can trace it. It's not some, uh, some mythological thing. Someone said this, listen to this. You can't, you can't live 
crooked lives and think straight. Whether you are a chauffeur or a chief of state. Nothing politically right that is morally wrong. He said, well, who, who's the author of morals? Better find out. You can't ignore morality just as you cannot ignore the sun. He had to be a blind man to ignore morality just as he ignores the sun. This is one that scares me. Wicked rulers are God's reward to wicked people. That's scary. He said, Brother Hammond, why are you so disturbed this morning? Number one, because I'm American. I'm disturbed. This is my home. This is your home. And people say, well, I don't like my home. Well, there is an airplane, RDU, will take you anywhere in the world to find a better home, brother. I'll pay your way. You got to stay there. Don't come back. <laughs> Amen. It's a one-way ticket. Now, I'm not saying we got it all together here. Nobody does. But after I finish a couple of thoughts, you, you will conclude we do got it a whole lot better than a whole lot of folks in the world. So David's attention focused on the groups of people in Israel as he read those Psalms. He mentions the oppressed. He mentions those who trust in the Lord. He mentions the afflicted. He mentions the needy. He mentions the poor. He sees the Lord as their safe, secure place as their what we call our refuge somebody told me that oh you 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 christians just have a have a crutch i said really he said yeah you believe in this god stuff and jesus stuff i said yeah okay that's my crutch tell me your crutch buddy i don't have a crutch i said yes you do Oh, I don't believe in anything. That's your crutch. You're real smart. I don't believe in anything. I said, the definition by itself shows that there's something wrong with you. You haven't thought through that process yet. We don't have a crutch. We have a cross. (laughs) The symbol that sets the whole thing in motion. There is no other symbol like the cross. That's why it is so repulsive to the world. That is, that is why when I preach in India and Africa, some of the people say this, oh, I can't believe God would do this. I can't believe God will stoop so low to give his son to be the sacrifice for sinful men like us. I said, you got a better plan? See, God hates uh, sin. It's obvious. We know that. We know God will just sin. Sunday school lesson made it so clear this morning. I don't believe God hates sinners or Americans. And I hope God doesn't judge our nation. See, I lived in a nation that has forgotten God and has 330 million gods. If you've got to replace one God with 330 million, arithmetic is messed up. It's easier to believe in one than 330 million. I thought so. I mean, I, I'm simple-minded. My mind goes to one very fast, and three, I, can't even, I don't even know how to write 330 million. But see, it seems like to me, he is already allowing us to drift. 
drift on a downward spiral to destruction. And listen to me. That is the worst kind of judgment you could ever have from God. He lets us go. Do it. Do it your way and see how well it turns out. Matter of fact, you ought to learn from other nations how well it has turned out for them. I mean, it, you don't have to be a genius to figure out it, ain't, it didn't work too well for other nations. And it's not working too well for other nations. Remember, every time election comes around in India, the qualification to run for politics in India is simply this. You've got to have a rap sheet. If you've got a couple murders on the list, you're good, buddy. We're not too far, are we? The worst judgment would be God leave you and me alone. And I don't ever want to get to the point, leave me alone. Like the little boy flying a kite and the man comes up and says, son, how do you know your kite is up there? It's past the clouds. He says, sir, I feel the tug. That's good. Do you feel the tug in your spirit, in your soul, which are breathed into you by the living God who says, I tug at you because I want you. I got the best interest in mind for you. Do you feel the tug? Run to that tug, brother. Hang on to that tug. Beg God, don't ever, don't ever leave me to myself because I am scared of myself. Here's another psalm, Psalms 33. Here's what it says. Blessed is the nation. Now you can take the word nation and put individual there. You know that. Blessed is the nation or the people or individuals. Who are these blessed ones? Whose God is the Lord. That psalm is cry to people. You're blessed. You're favored. If God is your Lord... There is none other, you know that. David reason to praise the Lord. They included the praise of God's word in that Psalm 33. It's amazing. His creative power, his sovereignty over the nations, his all-seeing vision, his faithful works, and his deliverance of his people. This verse, simply what we just read, blessed is the nation or individual people whose God is the Lord. This word tells me God has blessed America because we have made God to be our Lord. What will happen? What will happen when we make other things our Lord? Things that don't matter for eternity and we bow to them and we sell our soul to them. Here's another verse, Psalms, I mean Proverbs chapter 14. Righteousness exalteth a nation. Put your name there. Righteousness, doing right in the sight of God by being made right by the blood of Jesus. Righteous people. Righteousness exalteth a nation. 250 plus years, God has favored this nation. This is the reason. But sin is a reproach to any people, any form of sin, any digression from truth. It has to have a dire ramifications. There is no such thing as to play with a poisonous snake and come out good. There is no such thing as drinking a one drop of poison ain't going to bother me. It's my business, not yours. That's a sad mentality, isn't it? I'm glad doctors don't do that when we go to the emergency room, right? Oh, you got a problem? I got a problem. See you later, buddy. The Bible promises that any people will be blessed when they follow God's righteousness. The Bible also promises that when we follow sin, it will be our reproach. I wrote this down from Mayflower Compact, November 1620. 
This is a document that gave the direction to this nation. 1620. Three biblical truths those men and women believed on a Mayflower. Number one, they believed the nation will glorify God. The new nation will glorify God. Number two, they believed the new nation would extend Christianity, the advancement of the Christian faith. Let me, let me say to those who are in this room or listening, you got something in Christianity? <laughs> you need to do some homework. You need to know how Christianity has elevated women all around the world. How Christianity has protected children all over the world. How Christianity has brought freedom all over the world. And how Christianity has delivered us from the curse of sin. I'm no longer slave to sin. I'm free to serve God. They believed their authority was from God. The third thing they believed. They planted a colony in the name of Almighty God. Right now, I think Brother Phil used this phrase this morning. Right now, our nation is sick unto death because we have forgotten God. Listen, government is not God. And when government does take the role of God, we're in deep trouble. You just got to look across what the communism has done. Where they erase God and they themselves elevate as God. And we know what happens to people like that. There's a story of a man named Herod. When people gave him an ovation and said, oh, this is a voice of God. Ooh. The highest, <laughs> Quincy Adams. Sixth President of the United States of America, 1821. Here's what he wrote. The highest glory of the American Revolution was this. It connected in one indissoluble bond the principle of civil government with the principle of Christianity. From the day of the Declaration, I believe every, every person in America needs to read the Declaration of Independence. We got to reacquaint ourselves with what took place 200 some odd years ago to give us what we have today. This ignorance is not a bliss. If a foreign national who comes and gets naturalized, they have to read the Constitution and learn some of the things. By God, all of us need to know. The highest glory of American revolution was that. He said the. Uh, from the day of the declaration, the American people were bound by the laws of God. Did you catch that? The principle of civil government and Christianity were linked together in an unbreakable bond. Nearly all citizens acknowledge Christian biblical principle as the rules of their conduct. That was this land. In 1913, President Woodrow Wilson, listen to what he says. America was born to exemplify the devotion to the elements of righteousness which are derived from the Holy Scriptures. In March 1931, Congress adopted the Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem. Did you know what the fourth stanza says? Let me say it for you. Blessed with victory and peace, may this heaven rescue land praise the power that has made and preserved us as a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause is just, and this be our motto, in God we trust. I got to hurry. I can hear some growling stomachs this morning. When the preacher hears it up here, you know we got some hungry people. Brother Caleb's going to turn me off. He says, son, we're not paying you for overtime, you know. So. I believe all of us will agree. God reigns, God rules, and God overrules. 
Proverbs 21 says this, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of the water, rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. God can change a ruler, God can remove a ruler, and God can overrule a ruler. So you ask, should I pray for my leader if they're wicked? Yes, we must. Isn't that interesting? The guy who was writing, Paul writing to Timothy, encouraging him uh, the church to pray. It was a nightmare for the Christians. The Roman Empire breathed down on them. Persecution was severe. And there would have been every reason to not find this passage when Paul says, hey, pray. Here's what it says in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2. I exhort therefore, he says, I urge you, I plead with you, I beg you that first of all, first of all, don't curse the darkness. Light a candle, please. Let your light so shine. He says, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. All men, including righteous and unrighteous. All men, then he goes on to say, for kings and for all that are in authority. He didn't say those who are Christians. He said all kings and those who are in authority. Pray for them. Why? Here's the reason why. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Boy, honesty is gone, isn't it? What is honesty? The greatest responsibility in America is not the White House. You know that, folks. It's the church house. This is where it starts. We are to pray for the, our government, pray for those who are in authority. We pray for our nation, as Chronicles teaches us in Second Chronicles. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and pray, not play, pray and seek his face. That's another element that is forgotten. I mean, I don't know people come up to me and say, Brother Hammond, I am really seeking God. I'm really in pursuit of the Holy One. I want to know Him. It's a casualty. May seek my face and turn from their wicked way. I believe that goes in hand in hand. If I'm getting closer to God, I'm getting away from sin, my friends. So when people say, why our nation is so sick, we're away from God. Why I got these issues in my life? Hey, start drawing near to him. And he draws near to you. You'll draw away from sin and that thing will leave you. Let me close. <laughs> you say, hurry up. I want you to recognize a few things and I want you to do a couple of things as we close. Number one, we must recognize the power of God's word which has always been under attack and which always will be because it's the truth. Recognize in your personal life the power of God's word. My friend, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, all they derive their thoughts from this. I mean, this is the greatest document on planet Earth. No wonder the devil goes after you and me and keep us fussy and, you know, away from the truth. We want to listen to people's opinion. Let's listen to God's truth. We must have right living. It only comes from God's word. A right thinking only comes from right God's word. Right solution that comes from God's word. And right principles comes from God's word. All are found right here in the eternal word of God. Isn't it good? <laughs> Number two, second, we must recognize and return to our obligation to the Creator. We have an obligation to Him. You see, freedom is two sided coin. One side is privilege, the other side is responsibility.
We must recognize God's providential care of this nation and his blessing on our people. Thirdly, we must recognize every person, no matter, no matter what color, race, religion, we must recognize every person has rights to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. You said why? Because they are created in the image of their creator. That's why. That's why the Hindus and the Muslims and the Buddhists and all the ism and schism will not say that. Only Christian faith will say that. That every living, breathing person is stamped by the image of God. And they are worth something. Why? Jesus paid his life. Gave his life for them. So we must recognize that and remember that. Therefore, every American, all of us, has vast potential because of liberty, but vast obligation to ensure this liberty is available to everyone else. We have obligation to our government that protects our liberties, to our way of life that provides liberty, and to our heritage that guarantees our liberty. And here's what I want us to do now. Number one. We must repent of our personal sin and rebellion. At the house of God, judgment must begin here. I cannot dabble in sin. I cannot pretend that it's not affecting me and affecting us. It just, it just has that, sin itself has that nature, contamination. Number one, we must repent of our secret sins, whatever they are, God knows you know, and our rebellion. We must forsake the pursuit of selfish pleasures just for the sake of pleasures. Number two, we must confess our national sin. We must recognize our national sin will bring God's judgment. Always pray in your wrath. Remember mercy, O God. Remember mercy. Number three, we must not give up hope. You see, as I said earlier, it's not the White House that's going to solve our problems, brother. If that's your hope, you're in real trouble. As bad as our nation is, America is the best place to worship God in the world. A bad, uh, as bad as drug abuse and robberies and rape and violence in uh, our land, it's still the best place in the world to live. As terrible as America is in turning away from Bible reading, Bible teaching, prayer in public arenas, and embracing atheistic evolution, America can have revival. And that brings me to my last point. We must pray. We must fast and pray for revival. My own personal life, Lord, begin it right here. Someone described fast, the word fast has a meaning. It's as though we, when we go through an emergency, and here's what they said. Fasting is like going through a hurricane. We don't think about eating. We simply work to survive. That's fasting. It's like when our car breaks down in the middle of a snowstorm. We don't think about what's in our pocket or something to eat. We look for a shovel our warm clothes, we concentrate on survival. So we must fast, go without food. We must pray, begging God to forgive us and revive us. I read the last verse and we'll pray. Daniel chapter 9. Good as man Daniel was. I want you to listen to his prayer. He's living in a bondage in a nation that is an enemy. 
He says, now, our God, hear the prayers and petition of your servant. That's a good place to be. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city or the nation that bears your name. We do not make request of you because we are righteous. But because of your great mercy, Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay because your city and your people Would you stand for a prayer, please? Father, thank you. Spirit of God, thank you.